morning to all of you. I am uh, presuming that my mic is okay. Uh, okay. Well, what a pleasure once again that we have to be able to meet uh, here physically and to the many who are joining us online. I know on Zoom we have, I'm presuming there are those in uh, on YouTube also joining. And so I would just want to uh, thank you for joining us in uh, Zoom land, in YouTube land, and of course on the ground here. Uh, it is as Nelson and the and uh, Selena was telling us, uh, and of course, as we were being led in the song worship, uh, it's wonderful for us to be able to count our blessings, uh, especially through the difficult times we have been. Uh, and one of those things not uh, being that we are not being able to fellowship. And fellowship is such an integral part of our Christian lives. And so uh, we're grateful to God that we can meet. And like was announced by our team lead, Anand, uh, we want to be able to come back. But since there is still uh, uncertainty about the kind of uh, danger that's uh, extent, we will continue to do online. But at least once a month, we must be able to come. And we will keep you all notified on that. Well, as we move into a new year, what is the usual wish that we all do and give one another? Right? Happy New Year, right? <laughs> that is what we all uh, wish one another. That was, that was what we did last year. We wish everybody Happy New Year and, of course, we were able to hug or shake hands. But as we neared the end of February into March, do you think it was any more happy? <laughs> Slowly, all the happiness, it seemed like, began to fade away. The pandemic, a word we have never used, now began to be used so often, the pandemic erased all the happiness that we had wished everybody. And the way things look as we are now moving into a new year, the challenges are going to remain or maybe even intensify, maybe becoming more difficult. And so when I uh, just reflect upon this, I feel reluctant to wish everybody a happy new year anymore. And that's why you might find my title a bit strange. I have cut out that happy. And uh, I'm hoping that the new year will be better. <laughs> better than 2020, better than 2019, 18, 17, and I was just wondering, would it be more appropriate for us to wish each other a better new year as we move into 2021? Uh, I'm presuming that tough times are still ahead. Uh, and uh, we honestly, you know, hope that 2021 will be better than 2020. And so let's just take an honest look at our situation as we move into this new year, right? Uh, and as we talk about uh, this new year, we say happy new year, right? And so I have to ask about, you know, ask ourselves the question, what is new that will be happy for us, as, especially as we look into the future? Right? What is new? Can we, like I was saying, can we honestly look forward to a new year, a new future filled with happiness? Now, you might scold me a bit and say, oh, come on, Pastor Dan, 
Why are you so negative? We live in a world where we are constantly told, be positive, be positive. And you might, you might uh, conclude that I'm being a little negative. Uh, I think I'm trying to be realistic rather than negative. Uh, because we just can't ignore the reality and the situation around us as we see it. I'm sure you will agree with me that the world indeed has become more unstable, isn't it? I mean, they're now talking about a new strain of virus or other several strains of new, uh, new strains of the virus. And uh, that is certainly not something that we had expected. And the UN officials from the United Nations are, are also telling us that this, we are probably, this is not the only pandemic we are going to be facing. Maybe there are others that's going to, you know, descend upon uh, our world. And as we talk about, you know, situations ahead and situations in the future, uh, you know, you keep wondering about hospitalization and medical, you know, treatment and medical costs. And many of you know how the costs are increasing on a daily basis. Well, along with that, as though this pandemic, so-called so pandemic was not enough, you look around us, you look into the world, you look at countries, you look at, look, look at the geopolitical situations around us. There is some kind of a new nationalism that is beginning to raise its head. People are talking about, you know, a nationalistic fervor, and it's happening all over the world. People are talking about how you must love your country, which we thought we did. And now they are bringing in new ways to say that if you don't do this, you don't love your country. And so it's confusing. And the situation doesn't look too good, really. In, you know, some, some have said, I was watching a... Uh, an interview by a very famous author and he was said uh, he said in this interview that this new nationalism is based on ex on on uh, prejudice rather than patriotism and you can see that happening all over the world and of course the economic upheaval of course we all know even as uh, nelson was mentioning people losing jobs less salaries uh, and uh, we, my wife and I, as we run the school, we be tr tremendously affected, not being able to pay our teachers the wages because of uh, a complete downturn in the income of the school. We also see freedoms being restricted. Our freedoms are beginning to be curtailed, and all kinds, in all kinds of ways. There is a sense of uh, fear that our freedoms are being taken away. Well, that's the geopolitical situation. Look at the human situation. You know, look at human behavior. And it is becoming more unpredictable, right? Humans are becoming so strange, uh, selfish in their behavior. Look at the leadership all over the world. What kind of what is the caliber of our leadership? And I've, I'm using another word which we never used to use in, in some ways, but you probably heard of the word narcissism. Narcissism means, you know, self-love, those who f love themselves, who fall in love with themselves and keep boasting about themselves and keep praising themselves. And don't you see that happening all over the globe? coming from especially leadership and I keep wondering to myself as a as a disciple of Jesus as one who want to follow Jesus what happened to humility what happened to the foot washing attitude that we are supposed to have because I see it even in Christian leadership my if you see some of the YouTube videos about evangelicalism 
and about the way they are, you know, uh, manifesting them, their faith. Uh, 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 the least I can say is disgusting. I can't see humility. And God said, you know, I resist the proud. And we are all seeing people boasting about themselves. Christian leadership boasting about themselves. What happened to washing the foot? You know, so we are unprecedented times that we are facing. And people are becoming blatant in their wrongdoing. They do wrong and they boast about it. It's like now a new slogan. I am wrong and I'm proud about it. That's the new slogan it almost seems like. And then there are human failings. And that comes closer to home, isn't it? Well, of course, uh, we know of human failings of famous, important, influential people falling short of moral behavior. And some of you might know what I'm referring to. We are all failing in one way or the other. We are all falling short. Some are at least honest to confess it. And in my many counseling situ you know, sessions that I've had with people, I can see counselees. Some of them are honest to tell me, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. Some are not as honest as that. And I remember one person saying, you know, I have such a horrible anger issue. It keeps coming in my way. It keeps coming in the way of my progress as a disciple of Jesus. And it's good that they can recognize that. Right, But more and more we see we are all so imperfect. In one sense, we are tired of being imperfect. And I can honestly uh, confess that I am tired of being imperfect. Even as I face the various issues that I have to face as a church leader, sometimes I have to suppress my anger. Sometimes I have to literally suppress my hatred as I see what I see happening around. And I know that it is wrong for us to harbor any sense of hatred. Right? How I wish that I could overcome my problem. How we all wish we could overcome our problems. And so perhaps I should say, you know, we are imperfect people in an imperfect world. Imperfection written large. Well, so, do you still want to be happy? Do you think we can wish Happy New Year? <laughs> I've just painted you a picture which doesn't sound very happy, does it? Now, I certainly want the New Year to be better. But is there hope for, a, for, for true happiness? Is there hope for, uh, you know, things to be better? And that is what I'm hoping. Uh, Is, uh, my slides are not moving, looks like. Uh, yes, uh, I'm using a so-called emoji with that big uh, question mark. What kind of a year are we looking forward? Is there, is it going to be better or is it going to be happy? And if so, what is that hope? Do we have hope for a happy, you know, uh, 2021 and beyond and so I would like to put this hope you know in this particular manner and let me see if I can move this around yes I would like to say that imperfect people in an imperfect world worshiping a perfect Jesus Christ I believe that is my hope I have no hope in uh, us as people I have no hope in the world as we see things around it, but there is only one hope for us, that Jesus Christ is perfect, right? Uh, we don't have it yet, and I'm hoping it will be delivered. We're having a new calendar printed, and we are hoping we can distribute it to you and give you some extra copies to give it to your friends. But in the January uh, page, we have written, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. 
And so that is where I borrow my thought from. And this is the scripture I'd like to read where we take it from. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Uh, that is my hope in Christ and to be able to experience that new creation. That indeed is our only hope, I believe. This is where our hope of happiness lies. Uh, because Jesus Christ is the one who overcame the old world. The old, he has overcome it. He's given us a new life. And soon, he will give us a new world. Doesn't the Bible talk about a new heavens and a new earth? And that is what we can look forward to. He will perfect our lives. And one day, we will have the opportunity to experience the fullness of that life. And only then can we be truly happy or truly experience a happy new year. Happy New Year, Happy New Creation, Happy New Forever, Happy New Eternity. And so I ask the question, why is it so important that we focus on Christ? Why is it that in Christ is where ultimately our true happiness lies? True happiness doesn't lie in us or what we can do. Sap, hap, true happiness doesn't, re, uh, you know, reside in self-realization. Have you heard of that? Self-realization. As though I have, you know, all the resources in me to realize happiness, I can't. I have no faith in humanism. And lots of people talk about humanism. Humanism, we see what humanism is all over the world. The poor people being trampled underfoot, and we have seen it happening when the pandemic began. What humanism are we talking about? Right? Or naturalism. All of this are nonsense because we see the manifestation of its evil. There is no good in humanism. There is nothing good that comes out of us. And I will read you a few scriptures that show us that. And so I asked the question, why is it so important that Jesus Christ is the one who makes sense? It is in him we have ultimate happiness. And I go to Galatians chapter 5. Let me read to you from verse 19 onwards where it says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, a wonderful description of humanism, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. A wonderful description of humanism. Why? Because we clearly are told that we are dominated by a sinful nature. We are dominated by a sinful nature. Doesn't look too hopeful for us, right? When we look at ourselves and we talk about self-realization. What kind of a self-realization can we have when sinful nature still dominates? Notice, these are all expressions of the sinful nature. They are the results of a sinful nature. They are not a sin in itself. If you look at that list, that is not the sin. That is the result of sin. Because of a sinful nature, we see all of this being manifested. Right? And it's inclusive. None of us can point a finger at the others. Is there anyone who would like to raise their hands and say, I am free from any, all of those? Are you free from even one of those? I don't think so. I don't think so. All have fallen short. And notice what happens in that state of situation, that state of reality in verse uh, 
uh, reading, uh, continuing in verse 21, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Boy, that is a, that's serious. Right? We will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is telling us the kingdom of God is not available for those who are manifesting this because of a sinful, inherent sinfulness that we have inside of us. Uh, Paul reiterates this to the Corinthians. But thankfully, as he talks about this to the Corinthians, he also gives us some hope. Right? Notice how he tells us uh, our sinful nature plays out. Right? Let me read to you that scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 9, it says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Remember again, these are results of sin inside of us, a sinful nature. They are not the sin by itself. Notice how inclusive it is. So none of us can be, you know, so, so uh, arrogant to think that, oh, I am okay. I can't identify myself in any of that. Sorry. <laughs> he, is, he is using as many words as possible to describe what the sinful nature inside of us can result in. We all struggle with one or many of those. Right. Uh, so who does this include? All. And he once again reiterates, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. In one sense, that's nice. It's good to know. It's good news that this such will not inherit the kingdom of God. You must be saying, why? Then who's going to inherit the kingdom of God? Yours, you, I just said that we're all guilty of that. And then it says, these will not inherit the kingdom. Then who's going to inherit the kingdom? Am I being too harsh? You know, it's actually good that such people don't inherit the kingdom of God. You know why? Because we want happiness. We want joy. We want peace. We don't want this stuff. We don't want to be living with all this nonsense that we see around us. We don't want to experience any of this this is what is causing the problem right now comes the hope what is the hope that paul leaves for us i go on to read in the same chapter verse 11 and such were some of you but here comes the hope you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice it says some of you. He is talking to the church. And he is seeing all of this stuff manifested in the church. Church members who are were living in that kind of a you know, situation. Some had some sins. Others had others. And all were guilty in one way or the other. Even as... Paul tells to the Christians in Rome, he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news, where the true happiness lies, you are washed, sanctified, justified. How? Who? In the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus. When it says in the name, what it means is, it means that all what Jesus stands for, you right? It means the totality of who Jesus is, is now descending upon us and removing that sinfulness. It is done for us through Jesus, in Jesus. Divine intervention. Divine intervention is taking place because 
Jesus was God. And that's the reason why we are able to be washed and sanctified and justified because Jesus in his humanity was displaying or uh, manifesting a divine intervention through his divinity. And because of Christ's intervention in our lives, we go back to the verse that was read for us from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? Where it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We have become new, right? We see Christ to be our only hope as uh, we read in the scriptures. I'd like to continue to read where uh, we did in verses 19 and 21. Notice in verse 19, it says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. Isn't that wonderful? You read all the list of the sins or the manifestation of the sin. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to count any one of those. Whether you are a cheater or a greedy or a sexual offender, whatever, all those things that were mentioned, Jesus says, I will not count even one against you because I have taken it. I have intervened. I have washed it. I have sanctified you. I have justified you. Right? How did he do that? Well, let's read, oh, sorry, uh, let me just finish that re uh, reading in verse 21. It says, the sin, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? The sinful nature, notice, has been removed. When the sinful nature is removed, then we won't manifest all of those results of the sinful nature, which we read all, you know, uh, in the previous in the previous uh, slide and in this slide. When the sinful nature has gone, there is no manifestation of sin anymore. That is the reason why it says the kingdom of God will be free of all of those. See, actually, it's a hopeful verse. It might sound very frightening. None will inherit the kingdom of God. Actually, it's a very hopeful verse. What, what Paul is saying is, Jesus Christ is going to clean us in such a way that we can go into the kingdom without the sinful nature. He is saying, though we struggle with all these sins, he is powerful enough to cleanse us so thoroughly that the kingdom will no more have these. And we don't have to worry about any of those. Isn't that wonderful? I feel sorry sometimes when we all struggle with all kinds of sins. And I know some continue to struggle. I don't have to look too far. All I have to see is look at myself. This is really struggle. And I keep asking myself, when will I get rid of this? I know I can't do it by myself. My hope is in Jesus. In Jesus, he has so lovingly come and he has washed me, cleansed me so that he can take me into the kingdom, in the fullness of the kingdom without this, without struggling anymore of any of these sins. So as we conclude, let me reiterate some of those essential points, right? Uh, the first one, right? I just read to you earlier. We are imperfect people in an imperfect world. In other words, we cannot achieve perfection in this lifetime. And that may, and that is the reality. That is the reality we face. We can't achieve perfection in this lifetime. But let, not, let that not be, you know, discouraging. Because we have hope, even though we can't achieve perfection in this lifetime. I hope we all understand that. The Apostle Paul says, don't fool yourselves. <laughs> because we are not perfect. And there are some who like to say they are so perfect. 
have heard leaders come and say, I am the best, I am the greatest. And they dance around in front of the media. So appalling, so completely appalling to see those things happen, boasting about themselves. Right? Uh, perfection in this lifetime is an illusion. But we can't stop there. Let's go to that second point, essential point. We need, we need God's forgiving grace every moment of our lives. Every moment of our lives. Every morning as I get up and I say, God Almighty, forgive me for all my sins of the past, of yesterday. I begin a new day and I hope you can give me the strength that I will not commit like Nelson was telling us, we have a new page and I pray God give me the strength that I don't descend into those sinful attitudes. Isn't, wasn't that the prayer of the publican? You remember the story of the publican and the Pharisee, right? Uh, maybe you should read it. I think it is in Luke uh, chapter 18. I, I'm not sure, but... Uh, the publican and the Pharisee go to the temple. They are gone to pray. You know how the Pharisee prays. He's a narcissist. Oh, I'm not like this good-for-nothing idiot who's standing there and praying. I am so good. I am so, I fast twice a week or whatever. Narcissist to the hilt. He was praising himself. Right? Before the perfect God. But what did the publican do? The publican standing at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He recognized that he was not perfect. He was failing. He was failing. But he had hope. He had hope in a savior. And that's why he said, forgive me a sinner, because we have forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ. We have forgiveness. We have not only forgiveness, but we have a washing, a sanctification and a justification all done by Jesus, mind you, not by us. So that he will Remove all the spots and wrinkles. We can enter the kingdom of God. He wants us in the kingdom. He, it is not that he doesn't want any of us in the kingdom. Or oh, he doesn't want these attitudes. That's why he's cleansing us. And so. I hope we can have the attitude of the public. And recognize. We need forgiving grace every moment. And a third essential point I'll leave you with is. That does not mean we should stop trying. I am not for a moment saying that, you know, oh, Jesus is going to clean us. He's going to justify us. He's done everything. So, hey, I can just make hay while the sun shines or, uh, or do all kinds of nonsense. And, oh, and I can trust in Jesus. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. Right? That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, aren't we encouraged? In the Bible, to overcome, to flee temptation, to put off the old man and to put on the new man. Aren't we encouraged in the scriptures to strive for godly standards, not to live in sin? So we must try and we must work to bring excellence in our behavior. I'd like to see like you to see that uh, quotation, which I found very interesting. It is by Michael J. Fox, who is a, uh, a Hollywood actor, I think, and he is now suffering from, I don't know what kind of a disease it is. It's something that you, you can't stop shaking. Uh, Parkinson's, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it is, yeah. Uh, but interesting what he said. He says, I am careful not to confuse excellence with perfection. Excellence I can reach for. Perfection is God's business. <laughs> I thought it was very interesting. See, excellence is trying hard. Excellence is doing our part. Excellence is 
you know, straining and trying to overcome and trying to move away from sin, trying to flee temptation, allowing the Holy Spirit to strengthen us. But that doesn't give us perfection. Where does perfection come from? Only in Jesus, only in Christ. And so, brethren, as we, or maybe I have one more point there. The last point there is finally, we are set free from our sinful nature by Jesus Christ. What a wonderful hope we have that though we struggle, though we continue to battle our weaknesses, our shortcomings, we can hope that Jesus one day will cleanse us so thoroughly that the sinful nature is completely gone. So it's a journey. It's a journey we are on. So, as we move from 20 to 21, how shall I wish you? <laughs> I'd like to wish you a better new year. A better new year than 20. A better new year than 19 and 18 and all of those that gone by. Because I want us all of us to do better. I don't know about happiness. I am not sure if I can wish you Happy New Year because I'm not sure what's going to come and, uh, you know, destroy that happiness. But nevertheless, I'll take a chance and I will wish you a Happy New Year in Christ. In Christ. That's where our hope is. That's our only hope. Our only hope where we can not manifest the sin, the results of the sinful nature like we read in the scriptures. And so, brethren, may the old be gone. May the new creation in Christ bring you joy and peace and happiness now and forevermore. So, wishing you a better, happy new year in Jesus Christ our Lord.